Well, last time in Acts, if you remember, Stephen had been arrested uh, and he'd been taken to trial just for talking about Jesus. And when it was his turn to address the charges against him, instead of defending his actions, instead of explaining that this was all a big misunderstanding, instead of trying to talk his way out of it, instead of apologizing for following the leading of his Lord and Savior Jesus, Stephen proceeded to give a history lesson to the religious leaders. Uh, He reviewed the birth of the nation of Israel and told uh, how the Israelites had always persecuted specific people that God would raise up to use. And uh, they had always done it in the past, all the way up to they even persecuted Christ himself, the Son of God, and they would continue to persecute the followers of Jesus, including Stephen himself. Um, Well, this statement, it was not received well, if you remember, and they proceeded to stone Stephen to death. And, uh, well, his he he was martyred, and his martyrdom uh, was not in, in vain. Uh, God had a purpose in it. God used it. And I'm not saying God was responsible for the death of Stephen. I'm saying God will use any situation uh, in the best possible way that it can be used. Uh, If you recall, in the end of chapter 7, Luke informs us that Saul, who who would later become Paul, we're going to see, he was there at the stoning of Stephen. And in fact, he kept watch on everyone's robes. Uh, they had to take off their outer robes, you know, in order to kind of free up their arms to really throw the rocks uh, good and hard at Stephen. And Saul was there assisting any way he could. He's watching over the coats or the robes. And, uh, and that brings us right here to chapter 8, verse 1. Saul was in hard, hearty agreement with putting him to death, with putting Stephen to death. And on that day of great persecution... A great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house and dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. So we see Saul, who who later will become Paul the Apostle, ravaging the church. And and this word ravaging or or havoc is one translation. This is only used one time in the New Testament. And, And its meaning is derived from a wild animal tearing apart another animal and eating it. And so that's what that that term means, that ravaging. And Saul, he was a very, very zealous man. Uh, I think he was the most zealous person against Christ and, and his church. And later, as we see him as Paul the Apostle, I think he's the most zealous person for Christ and for the church. And, you know, it, it's interesting. God uh, doesn't make drones out of us when we surrender our lives to him. Uh, he likes our personalities. He, he gave them to us for a reason and uh, and he'll use our personalities now he may have to smooth off some of the rough edges and he does that but but he does he likes our personalities and he uses them and uh, and just as as we'll see him use this zealous personality of Saul in in tremendous ways uh, later on so Saul he's he's ravaging this group of believers in Jesus Christ And he's not just arresting those that were proclaiming Jesus out in public, like Stephen, but he was going from house to house, arresting believers. You know, there was was no lying low and and, and being a Christian in secret, or or saying that you were a believer, but really not living like you were one. Uh, You were either a Christian or you weren't. And and if you were, there was a good chance that you were going to be arrested, and, and possibly put to death, just like Stephen. Well, how did God use this persecution of the church to his advantage? Verse 1 tells us, And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Do you, do you remember the last thing that Jesus said before he ascended into heaven? It's Matthew twenty-eight nineteen. He said, Go therefore, and he's speaking to his believers, his disciples, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. 
So Jesus said, go and make disciples of all the nations. But they had not gone yet. They were still sticking together. And, and it, sounds just, it sounds just like the folks in Genesis, right, with the Tower of Babel that we studied just a few weeks ago. God told them, go populate the earth. And they, and they didn't want to be scattered. They stuck together. And, you, you know, we hear that saying, there's safety in numbers. And, and there's some truth to that statement. Unless you're in direct disobedience to God's direction. And that's definitely not a safe situation to be in at all. Uh, and, and so Jesus had said, go, and they had not gone. And now the church is under this severe, severe persecution, and what happens? They go. You know, God used this assault on the church to inspire the church to follow his direction. Prior to the persecution, they didn't want to go. You know, the church was, was growing by leaps and bounds, uh, and, and they wanted to just, just keep this good thing going. Yet Jesus wanted them to spread out. Well, why is that? Well, I think it's so he could grow the church in other uh, areas by leaps and bounds as well. You know, all at the same time. Why, why grow them one at a time when, when God's capable of using you know, every human being on this earth to their full potential simultaneously? Uh, if, if people were willing... God is certainly capable, and, and God is certainly capable of growing multiple fellowships of believers in cities uh, across the earth all at the same time. And so it makes a whole lot of sense when you look at it like that. You know, God wants them, let's spread out, let's get this thing going. Well, now all of a sudden, uh, and, and so they didn't want to go, but, but all of a sudden now there's this threat of arrest and death. And leaving town doesn't sound like such a bad idea anymore, right? You know, you can, sweetheart, I hear uh, Samaria is beautiful this time of year, you know. <laughs> yes, they, they do hate us there, but they won't arrest us and kill us over it, you know. And so God has a way of, of prodding us along, if you haven't experienced that, when, when we're a little hesitant to follow that direction. Uh, he has a way of, of making that seem a little more attractive or, or maybe allowing the current situation to become a little less attractive uh, like, like we see here. And, uh, you know, we've, we've had a lot of people called out of our fellowship by God uh, to other places to serve, and, and we've seen a lot of people called out of somewhere else to our fellowship to serve. And, and God is, is still in the business of moving folks around sometimes. Uh, even though most of the world, in an area-wise, has been reached for Christ, uh, he still uses us to grow each other, and he still uses us to reach individuals uh, in those areas you know, that, that maybe haven't heard or are just not obeying and believing. So now they're spreading out into the world. And, and uh, what did Jesus tell them to do as they spread out? He said, make disciples, right? Well, let's see what happens in verse 4. It says, Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. The crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them, shouting with a loud voice, and many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was much rejoicing in that city. So God, he, he used this horrible act of persecution on his church to spread the gospel all over the world. And those that were scattered went everywhere, preaching the word, yay, like they were supposed to. They were obedient to God's direction. You know, after they got this little push start to get them going. And what was the result? You know, could, could God really do a tremendous work for his kingdom in Samaria? I mean, Samaria? The, the place that any law-abiding Jew would not be caught dead in? Uh, J. Carl Laneley writes, By New Testament times, the Samaritans were regarded as apostate, unclean half-breeds. In traveling to Jerusalem from Galilee to attend a feast, Jews with religious scruples normally went through Perea to avoid the hostile and impure Samaritans. Well, why would a holy God want anything to do with these filthy Samaritans, is what the Jews would be thinking. Uh, do you remember Jonah? He was thinking the same thing. Why would God want to do anything with these filthy Ninevites? 
You know, why would God love the people that I hate? When really it's the wrong question, right? The better question is, why do we hate the people that God loves? It makes no difference to God what Jonah thought of the Ninevites. It makes no difference to God what the Jews thought of the Samaritans. It makes no difference to God what we think of a people group or of an individual, a neighbor, a co-worker, a classmate, uh, the person you know that has no business operating a moving vehicle on the public highway. Uh, our opinion of others makes no difference to God. God loves those people. He loves every one of them. And he, he most definitely knows more about them than we do. And, and yet, He still died for them. For every single one. Therefore, there, there must be something in that other person worth dying for. Right? I mean, because God's not a fool, is He? Well, Philip, he didn't care what his fellow countrymen thought of the Samaritans. Philip cared what God thought about the Samaritans. And if God wanted to make disciples of, of the Samaritans and the rest of the world, so be it. Philip, like Stephen, he was first called by God to distribute the physical resources of the church. He was one of the seven. Uh, to feed the widows, to wait on tables. You know, God often has us serve in different areas uh, in different ways. And I think God uses those different areas in different ways to help mold us and shape us for the next task that God will call us to. Now, God uh, calls Philip to be this first evangelist, basically, the first preacher in the church. And what was the result of Philip doing what God called him to do? Well, the people believed Philip as he preached the name of Jesus. And people were getting saved. Now, don't get the wrong idea. The power unto salvation is in the gospel. It's not in the person sharing it. But God wants to use us as vessels or, or tools to share his good news through. And so we see... These demons were being cast out. Uh, the sick were being healed, the paralyzed. And the city was rejoicing over God working through Philip. You know, and so Philip's thinking, man, Samaria is not such a bad place after all, right? I mean, people are rejoicing in the gospel here. Back home, they want to kill me on account of the gospel, or some of them. And that brings us to verse 9. Now, there was a man named Simon who formerly was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And they all, from smallest to greatest, were giving attention to him, saying, this man is what is called the great power of God. And they were giving him attention because he had for a long time astonished them with his magic arts. But when they believed Philip, preaching the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued on with Philip, and as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed. So Simon the sorcerer, he was not a magician in the modern sense of the word, uh, we call a magician today, uh, what we call him is really an illusionist. Uh, there's nothing supernatural happening. It's, it's just uh, they're skilled in making, making things appear to be supernatural. Um, Simon, on the other hand, he, he appears to have some supernatural power here. Enough, in fact, that people thought that he was the great power of God. Now, supernatural power has to come from a supernatural being. And, and all power comes from God, from the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But God has granted some power to the angelic beings. And, and not only the holy angels, but the fallen angels as well, which including Satan. And, and we see this display of power in many places in Scripture, including in the book of Job. You remember God gave Satan the authority to, to basically run Job through the ringer, and Satan did it using supernatural power. Uh, well, Simon did not know God. Uh, he did not believe. Uh, he did not have a relationship with God, and he had, had been displaying this power. Therefore, we must conclude that this power uh, that he had was not granted by God. 
And so it must have come from a fallen angel. And so Simon had some power, but, but it was limited, as we see. Uh, but it was still enough to impress the locals. And so, uh, uh, in fact, so much so that they didn't say that he had the power of God, but that he was the power of God. And uh, we do know that his power was limited because it says Simon was constantly amazed at the power of God displayed in Philip. And so Satan has some power, but when you hold his power up to God's power, the difference is amazing. It's amazing. And, and Simon was constantly amazed by the power of God in Philip. And it was, uh, and what does scripture say to the believer? It says, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world, right? God is in us, the believer. Satan is in the world. That's 1 John 4.4. 4. Greater is God in us. Well, Simon was impressed with this power that Philip had. And as it often happens, uh, men desire more power. Uh, God, ha God has given men a desire to lead. Um, for some, it's their family. For others, uh, it's in the workplace or in the government or, or even in the church. And just like with every natural desire we have, uh, Satan and our flesh will try to pervert that desire in a way that gives it control over us. And so... Uh, with uh, leadership, there can be a sense of power and that can grow uh, into a hunger for it. And we see this uh, in the political arena especially, uh, but it can affect anyone, even in the church. And uh, I really haven't had a problem with this, uh, and it's hard to imagine this even becoming a problem, uh, but I'm sure it'll come up at some point because it seems like uh, that's how Satan works. You know, it seems like you finally get one part of the flesh under control to total submission, and then, and then Satan attacks you with this whole new area that you weren't even expecting, and, uh, and you know, to just try to throw your focus off. And, and uh, so be in prayer for me. But, uh, well, Simon, he was attracted to this power, and not like the general population. I mean, they saw the power and they glorified God, and, and they desired to know God personally and they were getting baptized and they were turning their attention away from Simon to the real power of God the gospel message the salvation message through Jesus Christ Simon on the other hand saw the power of God and was amazed by it but he didn't necessarily desire to know God he just desired to have God's power and as we as we're about to see here in verse 14 now when the apostles in Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. So word gets back to Jerusalem. Uh, that the Samaritans are receiving the word of God and they're believing and they were baptized with water, but they had not yet been baptized with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit had come in them at the moment of salvation when they truly believed, uh, just like he did with the disciples. You remember when, when Jesus breathed on them and, and they, were, they received the Holy Spirit. Uh, but they still were waiting on the Spirit to come upon them on the day of Pentecost, you remember. And so it's the same way here. These, these people, they've been saved. The Spirit had come in them, but the Spirit had not come upon them for that empowering uh, of the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, so the church in Jerusalem, they, sends Peter, they send Peter and John to assist them in, in receiving the Holy Spirit upon them. And, and Peter and John laid hands on them and in prayer, and they, they received the Holy Spirit. And, and we're not told how the Spirit was manifested in, in them, but we are told that it could be seen. And uh, David Guzik writes, When Jesus gave Peter and the other apostles the keys of the kingdom of heaven, back in Matthew 16, 19, it was really for this purpose. Here they are officially welcoming those, the Samaritans, who had previously been excluded from the people of God, welcoming them into the kingdom of God. 
And so that's a, uh, just a neat correlation there. Well, then in verse 18, we're told, Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. So Simon sees the, the Spirit manifested in these new believers, and he's very impressed. Not necessarily impressed with the spiritual gifts that were manifested, but he was impressed that Peter and John could pass uh, the Spirit on to them, the other people by, by laying hands on them. And, and Simon sees that, man, and he thinks, man, this is too cool. This is way better than any power that I've ever displayed, and, and so I want to be able to do that too. And, uh, you know, I want to have this power to grant the Spirit of God on whoever I please. And so, you know, he says, hey, Peter, you know, come over here. And uh, he says, you know, I see what, see what you did there, and I'm, I'm liking it. And uh, so, you know, and he's pulling out his wallet. So what's it going to cost me, you know, to, to get some of that power off of you? And uh, you see, Simon, he wanted control over this power of God. Instead of wanting the power of God to have control over him, which is what it should be. And so, naturally, in his mind, he offers Peter money for it. And uh, Peter is quite offended here in verse 20. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. Phillips translates this phrase, To hell with you and your money. And that's exactly what Peter meant when he said, may your silver perish with you. Because he thought he could purchase a gift of God with money. Peter is basically telling Simon that he is not headed to heaven. Uh, he's not saved. He may have said he believed and he, he may have allowed himself to be baptized. But it was all in his head, not in his heart. Because Peter just saw what was in his heart. And it certainly wasn't the Spirit of God that was trying to buy the power of the Spirit of God. And so Peter says in verse 21, You have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Therefore repent of this wickedness of yours and pray that the Lord, that if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. So Peter has discernment and he sees that Simon has no part or portion, no understanding of Jesus and his message of salvation, no understanding of the gospel, no understanding of God's provision for man's sin. So Simon may have believed that Jesus existed on the earth, but he did not believe that his eternal salvation was freely given to him. Because of what Jesus did on the cross. Salvation is not something that we can earn or that we can buy with money. If that were the case, then God would have never paid such an enormous price for us by substituting his son for us. By, by executing his son in our rightful place of punishment. Peter says, your heart is not right with God. Your head may think so, but your motives show what you really think, what you really believe. Although Peter told him to hell with you and your money, uh, he says it doesn't have to be that way. He says your heart is not right with God, so you need to repent. You need to turn away from this desire for power and turn to God. You know, admit that you're a sinner, confess it to God, and turn away from it and turn to God. And pray that God will forgive you. And we know that God will, because uh, we're told in his word, right? Uh, he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness in 1 John 1, 9. And so Peter has this gift of discernment and he can see that, that Simon is full of gall or full of bitterness uh, and he's in bondage to sin. You know, sin has him bound, this desire for power, which is why Peter tells him to repent and to turn away from that sin and to pray that God will forgive him. And what is Simon's response in verse 24? But Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me yourselves, so that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Well, Simon still doesn't get it, uh, or he doesn't want it. He asked Peter to pray that he would escape God's judgment. 
uh, no confession of sin, no admitting that his heart was wrong, that his motives were wrong, no agreeing with God's assessment of him, and then asking God to change his heart, to change his motives. Uh, no asking God to help him repent and to turn from his sinful lifestyle. No, no seeking God's forgiveness. Just seeking an escape from punishment. Simon is still completely self-centered. No, no concern for God whatsoever. He's only con- his, his only concern uh, was with obtaining more power for himself. And now his only concern is about uh, escaping the punishment that he may suffer, that he may suffer. So Simon knew Jesus in a, in a historical sense, but he didn't know Jesus re- relationally. He didn't know Jesus intimately. He, he didn't know Jesus at all. He just knew about Jesus. Uh, Clark Van Wick says, you can miss salvation by 18 inches. The, diff, the distance between your head and your heart. Guys, if you, if you feel like you're, you could relate to Simon and, and maybe you're struggling with that, we'd love to pray with you this morning. And I'll be available up here. Lynn, Lynn's available. Um, we'd love to just pray with you during the last song. Just, just uh, come sit next to us and we'll pray for you. Or sit next to me. Let's pray, guys. Dear Lord, we thank you so much. Uh, for your saving grace, for loving us, Lord, and for uh, sending uh, your disciples out to share the gospel, to spread your good news throughout the world. And that's how we heard about it, Lord. I heard about you and, and come to know you, Lord. And, and I just ask that you would help us to continue that, Lord, that we would about be about uh, making disciples, Lord, of going out. It may not be going out to another country, but, but going out, uh, into the the workplace or going out into the community or going out in uh, the school or uh, at the market, wherever, Lord. Uh, I just ask that you would help us. Uh, it's a difficult thing for us, Lord, to uh, to be bold about you. And so, Lord, give us uh, a confidence of boldness in you and your word and your salvation, Lord. And, and just give us a heart for people. If there's people that, that we uh, struggle with, Lord, uh, and have trouble liking or loving, Lord. You, you love them, and uh, and just show us what you see in them, Lord. Help us to love everyone. You've called us to do that, and so help us, Lord. And so, Lord, as we go out this week, I just ask that you watch over us, that you bless us, that you keep us safe, Lord, and that we would just be uh, attentive to your leading and guiding this week, Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray.